From May 1918 to October of 1919, the Big Easy of New Orleans was the scene of a brutal serial killer. Targeting Italian immigrants, he would murder his victims and their families while they slept, cutting their throat with a straight razor or bashing their heads in with an axe. Referring to himself as not human, but a spirit and a demon from the hottest hell, he would kill six of his 12 victims. And 103 years later, the ghosts of some of his victims still haunt the places they lived or died. This is the unsolved case of the Axeman of New Orleans. Hey y'all, I'm Chris Calvert. And I'm her husband, Rob Potter. Welcome to Hitch to Homicide. For better or worse. Till death do us part. Welcome back, everybody. Yes, welcome, welcome, welcome. And for my Filipino friends. Oh, no. Maligayang pagdating, maligayang pagdating, maligayang pagdating. And that that holds special purpose and, and, and feeling for me because it's to my best friend in the entire universe, Mr. Jim, my, fel- my Filipino palapino. Mr. Paroco. Mr. Jim Paroco. And his beautiful wife. Denise, as, mm-hmm. as I call her, Dennis. <laughs> and Dennis, who sounds just like Karen Carpenter when yeah, she sings. she does. And She's the, amazing. And to the rest of the Filipino Paroco family, and my, my second family, love them all. We love you. Yep. Well, wherever you're listening, be sure to like, rate, and review. That helps other people to find us. And if you want to go in and write us a review, we'd really appreciate it. We're getting some funny ones. We're getting some good ones. Maybe I need to start uh, reading them again on the air. Yeah. Some of them are pretty good for sure. Yep. Also, I, I have to interrupt just for a second. I have like four best friends in the world, and the other three will be really hurt if I said Jim was my best friend in the world. So, you know, Tommy, Billy, John, and Jim, my four bestest friends in the entire universe. So I got to give everyone equal time. Well, it's time. middle school, so <laughs> BFFs. Is. You got to make sure you cover all the BFFs. Absolutely. Now I'm out of trouble. Now, and they're all amazing. Yep. I love them all. Yep. Did I already say wherever you're listening, like, rate, and review? You did. Okay. Because I interrupted you. Okay. <laughs> we are keeping with our spooky October theme. Okay. I've even got on a little bit of orange today. I have mine orange on. You get your bingle stuff on. I do. Yeah. Who I day? know. Who day? I know. Well, this one is old, okay. very old. And when I found it, I was like, mm, I don't know. I don't know if people would enjoy this one or not. But then the more I got into it and the more I found out that there were lots of ghosts associated with it, I was nice. like, let's go for it because it's October. We like ghosts. We do. We do like ghosts. <laughs> <laughs> and people are sending in all kinds of good um, recommendations for horror movies because I love them. They're posting them in the in-laws and outlaws. And if you're not a member of the in-laws and outlaws, all you have to do is go into Facebook and look for H2H in-laws and outlaws. Answer three little questions and you're in. Simple we love questions. that group. Yep. Yeah, we love that group. They're amazing. Yep. Go join. You won't regret it. Awesome. Lots of fun. Cool. Before I go down the scary road, let's thank some sources. LSU Reveal, Ranker, Wikipedia, NolaGhost.com, SmithsonianMagazine.com, BrewMinute.com. I will have a link to all of those in the show notes. Nice. You ready to do this? Let's do it. New Orleans, 1918. It was World War I, and many American soldiers and sailors were passing through New Orleans on their way to Europe to fight in the war to, quote, end all wars. Yep. I don't know that that was the war to end all wars because it was just World War I, and yeah. I feel like we're on the brink <laughs> of World War Three right now. But exactly. All that aside. At that time, it was the war to end all it wars. It was. Yeah. It was. But this is a time when New Orleans was being ravaged by not a killer like we talk about each week on this show, but a different kind of killer, one that even canceled the Mardi Gras celebration. 
It was the Spanish flu. Oh, wow. The great influenza pandemic. It killed an estimated 50 plus million people worldwide and 675,000 in the United States. Now that's a pandemic. It is. Compare that to the COVID-19 pandemic where there were 6.5 million deaths worldwide. Wow. But New Orleans is hit especially hard. So people were really just, they're just trying to stay alive to begin with. And then... Beginning May 23rd, 1918, Italian immigrant Joseph Maggio and his wife Catherine are lying in bed sleeping together in the apartment above their business. It's a grocery store and bar room on Upper Line and Magnolia Streets. The killer broke into their home and proceeded to cut each of their throats with a straight razor. Ooh. Yeah. Then before leaving, he took an axe from their home and bashed their heads in with it. Mm Mm-hmm. Joseph's brothers, Jake and Andrew, they find their brother and sister-in-law in the bed. Joseph will die moments later in the arms of one of his brothers. His dead wife, Catherine's body, is like draped over his. Wow. Inside the apartment, the police find the bloody clothes of the murderer. He changed into a clean set of clothes while he was there and left them behind before fleeing the scene. So obviously... He's put some forethought yeah. into this. And there's no DNA. And of course, there's no DNA. Yeah. Yeah. So police search everywhere in the apartment after the bodies are removed. But what they find is the bloody razor hmm. on the lawn of one of their neighbors. Wow. He wasn't very careful. He wasn't very careful. And when police search the premises of the grocery store, they figure out that the motivation couldn't have been money because all the money and all the valuables are still in the store. Nothing was taken. He was killing to be killing. Everything was everything was left alone. Wow. And the razor that was used to kill the couple was found to belong to Joseph's brother, Andrew. Oh. And Andrew had a barber shop on Camp Street. And his employee, Esteban Torres, tells police that Andrew had removed the razor from his shop two days prior to the murder, saying that he wanted to have a nick honed from the blade. He wanted to have a little nick taken out Uh, of the blade. Okay. So I guess they just file it down and sharpen it up even more, right? Yeah, they used to use a belt strap to sharpen. Yeah. Yeah. I always think of the barber of Seville and he's like. That's exactly it. "Mm Mm-hmm. Doing that number. Yep. (laughs) Andrew lived in the adjoining apartment to his brothers. He found his brother and sister-in-law just two hours after the attack happened. Mm. He had heard a strange groaning noise coming through the wall. And I would have to think that these walls are paper thin Yeah, in 1918. Yeah, if you're hearing somebody groan through the wall, that's... Uh... Yeah, but Andrew also said that the reason he couldn't hear what was going on through the walls was because he'd come home after a night of celebrating. He was getting ready to join the Navy, and he's three sheets to the wind. <laughs> he's drunk as a skunk. He had a boy's po- weekend. Yeah, and the police are a little bit surprised that he didn't hear the intruder as he made this forced entry into the house. And Andrew, the brother, and also Joseph, they become the police's prime suspects in the murders. Wow. It sounds like he had a boy's weekend, and and that was for my friend Tommy. (laughs) (laughs) You just had a boy's weekend this weekend. Mm, So he's still recovering from it. But the police are a little bit surprised that he didn't hear the intruder who made this forced entry into the house. And his brother, Andrew, Joseph's brother, Andrew, becomes the police's number one suspect. He's Hmm. prime suspect number one. But he's going to be released after investigators are unable to dispute his alibi. And he also tells them that he actually saw an unknown man lurking near his brother and sister-in-law's home before the murders. Always beware when somebody's lurking. Lurking, yeah. (laughs) The lurker. Yeah, there's a lurker. Yeah. And Joseph's wife, Catherine, had her throat cut so deeply that her head was nearly severed from her shoulders. Ouch. Wow. Wow. Nicole Brown Simpson vibes. Yeah, exactly. And she died immediately. Yeah. But police have no evidence and they have no suspects. And then he used an axe? And then he used, after he cut their throat with a straight razor, then he picked up an axe and bashed in their heads. Wow. Now, a block away from their house and at the scene of this crime, there's a message in chalk written in childlike handwriting that read, Mrs. Maggio will sit up tonight just like Mrs. Tony. Hmm. And still no one knows what that means. 
Then one month later, on June 27, 1918, grocer Louis Bessemer and his mistress, Harriet Lowe, were at the rear of his grocery store in the living quarters of the building at the corner of DeJornis and La Harp Streets. I probably just totally butchered that. <laughs> I'm so sorry, Nolans. I'm sorry I did that. But this is where he is. He's in his living quarters when he's clubbed with an axe just above the right temple, which fractured his skull and actually dented his brain. Ooh, geez, How do you this... dent somebody's brain? I don't know. I mean, I've met some people I think have a dented brain, but <laughs> apparently it actually happened to him. And then Harriet was hacked over the left ear, and she's found unconscious. And the couple is found the next morning when Zanka Bussemer the man who was driving a delivery wagon, a bakery wagon, he shows up to make his morning delivery and he finds them both just lying in a puddle of blood. Wow. And they're bleeding really profusely from their heads. And the police are called. And as they look around the place, they find Lewis's axe in the bathroom. Oh, wow. Yeah. And Lewis will later tell the police that he was asleep when he was hit in the head with the axe. So just like the first murders, he's asleep. Right. Now, this time, the police arrest somebody, Louis Ubicon. I'm sure I just messed that one up, too, but <laughs> that's the best I can do. He's a 41-year-old African-American man who was hired just a week before at Lewis's store. Okay. And now there's zero, zero evidence that pointed to Lewis that he had anything to do at all with hmm. the attacks. Okay. But police arrest him saying that he had conflicting accounts of his whereabouts on the morning of the attack. So he's, he's botching his alibi. Right. Then when Harriet regains consciousness, she tells police that she wasn't attacked by Lewis, but by somebody else. And the police dismissed her statement because of her, quote, disillusioned state, end quote. <laughs> what does that mean? I think it means this woman wakes up and she says it wasn't Louis Ubicon. It was somebody else. And they're like, ah, it's a woman. <laughs> that's a woman with a dented brain. Well, that's no, she's not even the one with the dented brain. She just had a passing blow oh, and i think they were just like mm, it's a woman yeah yeah she's yeah put her on the fainting couch because what year she's was this? in a disillusion state 1980 yeah exactly yeah and the authorities think the only explanation for the attacks is a robbery but once again there's nothing missing all the money is there all the valuables are still in the home right now, Louis Ubicon is released because, of course, they have absolutely nothing to charge him with. But then the newspapers look to Louis himself because of a series of letters written in German, in Russian, and in Yiddish. Wow. That are found in a trunk in his house. Okay. Rob's going to love this. <laughs> and lo and behold... Lewis. Every one of them said, welcome, welcome, welcome. No, oh. Louis Bessemer <laughs> is a World War I German spy. Really? He's a spy. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. So they start doing a deep dive into Louis Bessemer and his espionage. Wow. And a week later, after being in and out of consciousness, Harriet, she sings like a canary and tells the police that she thinks Louis is a German spy. Oh, wow. And Lewis is arrested. Okay. And then two days later, he's released because of unacceptable police work by the two lead investigators. But then he was once again arrested in August when Harriet Lowe, who was dying in Charity Hospital after a failed surgery, tells authorities that it was actually Lewis who attacked her with the axe. Okay. And Lewis is charged with murder and served nine months in prison before being acquitted on May 1st, 1919. <laughs> wow. It just gets fishier and fishier. Yeah, yeah. It stinks to high heaven. Yeah. Yeah. But let's talk about old Harriet, okay? The All girlfriend. Right. All right. After she's hacked about the left ear and she goes to charity hospital and she's the center of this media frenzy. Number one, because she's not the wife of Louis Bessemer. And yet she's sleeping in his bed. Okay. And when Lewis's real wife arrived from Cincinnati <laughs> a few days later after the attacks, the drama, the drama, 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 it just got bigger. You think? Yeah. And yeah. Harriet used her platform with the newspapers to talk about her dislike of the New Orleans police, including the chief of police, 
Because when they discovered that she wasn't Lewis's wife, they leaked it to the press and then Harriet just clammed up. Well, and that would have been a huge scandal back then. It is, and I even have in my notes, in the midst of the whole scandal, when she's released out of the hospital, she goes back to Lewis's house. Okay. She goes back to Lewis's home, but she has a partially paralyzed face from the attack. And she's actually going to die on August 5th, 1918, after doctors try to perform surgery to repair her partially paralyzed face. Plastic surgery gone bad. Well, I don't even know if it was plastic <laughs> surgery. I don't think there was plastic surgery in 1918. But this is, this is just a couple of months after the attack. And yeah. I'm sure today they would be like, OK, so your face is a little paralyzed, but... Those muscles, all of that, those nerves, let's wait and see what happens. Can I be a conspiracy theorist here for a second? She's also a spy. Yeah. Or the fact that she knows too much and they were paid off to conveniently get rid of her during surgery. Didn't think of that. Mm -hmm. I did not think of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, there are lots of people who think this wasn't the work of the Axeman at all, but there are those who believe it was. So I kept it in my story because I knew Rob would love the fact that he was a German spy <laughs> exactly. from World War I. Yep. Right. On August 5th, 1918, the same day Harriet dies at Charity Hospital, Anna Schneider is attacked in the early evening hours. Now, Anna is 28 years old and she is eight months pregnant with her husband's mm. child, Ed. Okay. Anna lives on Elmira Street. I got that one right in New Orleans. Elmira. That's the wrong one. Oh, sorry. <laughs> She wakes up to find a dark figure standing over her in bed. Now, we all know <laughs> this is one of my biggest fears. <laughs> I have to say, a lot of times, you know, especially if I'm in the middle of a film, I'll be down here in the studio and I don't get done till maybe one or two in the morning. And when I go upstairs to go to bed, I open the bed bedroom door as quietly as I possibly can, because I know that at any minute, if I make a noise and I'm standing there, I'm going to hear. <gasps> That's because <laughs> <laughs> That's because I read all this true crime stuff and I write all this true crime stuff. Yep. And I have PTSD from my children's st- Standing over top of me in the middle of the night. Real quick, I forgot to tell you this. We had our boys weekend this uh, this weekend, Tommy Milligan's uh, house up on the lake. And I went to bed and in the middle of the night, I kept hearing creaking and stuff. And my mind, being half asleep, went to... The house is haunted. No, there's somebody in the room. So I got to check to make sure that somebody's not coming after, after me with a knife. Did you check the room? <laughs> yeah, the door was shut. Oh. Of course I did. I rolled over and looked every time. <laughs> so <laughs> this podcast is messing me up for life. I'm sorry, honey. <laughs> you should have known this about me when you married me. I don't know what else to say to you. For yeah. better or for worse. Yeah, for better or for worse. Exactly. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Sorry. But she wakes up. There's this dark figure standing over her bed and... And the dark man begins to bash her in the face repeatedly. Her scalp had been cut open and her face was completely covered in blood. Anna was discovered just after midnight by her husband, Ed, who is returning home late. He's getting home about midnight. Okay. And he's coming home from work. And Anna said that she remembers nothing of the attack because she's been hit in the head yeah. over and over and over again. Yeah, That's that, why she doesn't remember anything. That would tend to do something to your Nobody remembers <laughs> any of this because they've been hit in the head over and over again or are they being paid to be quiet or yeah. I mean there's a, there's a lot there's a lot going on. I can't even remember where my car keys are and I've never been hit in the well, head. Well, that's I don't know that I would admit to that. <laughs> but okay. It's old timer's disease. Oh, no, I know. <laughs> Go ahead. But even though she's been hit in the head and even though she can't remember, she gives birth to a healthy baby girl. Wow. Two days after the attack. Wow. Two days. That's that's, that's a, a woman. That's a hearty woman. That's a woman, right? That's some German stock right there. I don't know that she's German, but <laughs> well, you can go you can go with that if you want to. We'll say it is. <laughs> Anna's husband tells police that nothing was stolen from the home except for maybe like six or seven dollars that was in his wallet. And oddly enough, the windows and doors of the apartment had not been forced open. And authorities had come to the conclusion that Anna had been attacked with a lamp a lamp that was on a nearby table. So not an axe, right? but a lamp. And I'm just wondering, could he not find an axe in that house? Because all of the axes and the straight razor, they're all inside these homes. Well, once again, I'm going to be a conspiracy theorist. Was it a copycat murder? 
I mean, it could have been. Yeah, I mean, if he's not using an axe, you would think that the guy would make sure that he has an axe before he goes in. No, 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 no. He's using what's in the home. Right. And everybody, pretty much everybody had an axe in their house at this time. True. Because they were chopping wood because okay. they had wood-burning yeah. fireplaces yeah. since 1918. I'll buy into that. Okay. Yeah, they're, they don't have a nest, honey, like you, <laughs> controlling the thermostat from your phone, <laughs> screwing with everybody's mind about what the temperature is on whatever floor in the house. Yeah, my nickname is Gadget Guy. Mm-hmm, yeah. Exactly. Okay. So who did they arrest this time? Because they had to arrest somebody. Right. James Gleason, who police said was an ex-convict. And Gleason was later released due to a complete lack of evidence and he stated that he originally ran from authorities because he had been arrested so often yeah and lead investigators began to publicly speculate that the attack was related to the previous incident involving bessemer and maggio so they're starting to like connect the dots right sure but the axeman's still on the loose in nola and New Orleanians, New Orleanians. That was good. They, they're they terrified. Yeah. And the press noted that the Italian immigrant community was especially fearful, with panic-stricken men staying up all night to guard their families. And New Orleans Superintendent of Police Frank Mooney suspected that the murderer was a, quote, murderous degenerate who gloats over blood, end quote. That's pretty obvious. But, well, he's not stealing anything. He's killing to be yeah. killing. Yeah. Yeah. He's not raping. Right. He's just killing. It's a sport. And the Crescent City had known Italians from its earliest days. And Italian businesses and Italian business communities established themselves in the city well before the Civil War. And most of these people came from northern Italy. They came from Sicily. Yeah. So there's this great influx of Sicilians into the state. And the city enticed men who were Italian to go from Sicily to Louisiana because they were sugar planters. Hmm. Yeah. And they thought the Italians were, quote, a hardworking, money-saving race and content with few of the comforts of life, end quote. Wow. Yeah. So Sicilians flooded into the port of New Orleans and dominated Italian immigration into Louisiana. Over 80 percent of the Italian immigrants who arrived in New Orleans were Sicilian. And what's interesting, because the French. Yes. Well, it is. It is mostly French. Yeah. Yeah. But that's because France, apparently, and I learned this on our tour in New Orleans. And someone can email me and correct me if I'm wrong. But France took all of their thieves and murderers and <laughs> put them on a boat and shipped them to New Orleans. Here you go. There you go. Take it. Yeah. Wow. But one of the most common upward trajectories for an ambitious Sicilian in New Orleans and elsewhere, from a sugar planter, plantation worker, to a truck farmer, to a peddler, to a grocer. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So by the early 20th century, Italians were taking over the corner grocery store business, and they owned only 7% of grocery stores in New Orleans in 1880, but by 1900, 19% were Italian-owned. Oh, wow. And by 1920, they ran fully half of all the grocery stores in the city. Wow. Yeah. Good for them. So that's a little inside into this, Mm -hmm. because all of these people who are getting murdered are grocers. Yeah. Italian grocers. Wow. August 10th, 1918, Pauline and Mary Bruno were being looked after by their uncle, Joseph Romano. He's an elderly guy. And that night, August 10th, the two girls were startled awake by the sound of commotion. They flew into their uncle's room. Their uncle, Joseph, had taken a serious blow to the head, which resulted in two open cuts. But these two managed to catch the axe man fleeing the scene and said that he was a dark-skinned, Heavy set man who wore a dark suit and a slouched hat. Hmm. So he was proper, at least. <laughs> well, all I could think of was it's the men in black. Yeah. It's like the men in black. Yeah, 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 yeah. He's in a dark shadow. He's dark skinned. And, you know, that could be anything. That could be an African American, mulatto. It could be, it could be an Italian it man. It could be an Italian, yeah. It could be anybody. Yeah. So Joseph actually, after he's hit in the head, Joseph actually walks to the ambulance after his attack. Mm. He's walking. Wow. But he dies two days later due to his severe head trauma. Wow. 
He was like walking and talking. So he basically had a brain bleed and then died. I I don't know, but he's dead after two days. And this time the home had been ransacked, but nothing was stolen. And authorities found a bloody axe in the backyard and discovered that a panel of the back door had been chiseled away. So this is one of the things that they talk about in this case. They never see any signs of forced entry into any of these homes. So they're like, how's this guy getting in? Yeah. So what he was doing is, you know how a door will have panels, yeah. like like rectangular sure. panels, sure. two above or two below? Right. He was chiseling out just one of those tiny little panels wow. and slipping through. I thought he was a big guy. Exactly. Exactly. So that was their theory. That's, that's who they said they saw. Okay. But I think he was a big guy. So is there a child involved that's going through the door and then letting an adult in? Yeah. Don't know. Yeah. Don't know. Joseph's murder created a state of chaos in New Orleans because residents are living in constant fear that the axe man is coming for them next. Sure. And police got a bunch of reports in which people were saying that they had seen the axe man lurking, lurking <laughs> again. There's that word again. <laughs> in New Orleans neighborhoods. And a few people even called to report that they had found axes in their backyard. So they're thinking, did he show up to my house? Did he mm. not get in? Yeah. Did he just leave an axe in the backyard? Right. But once again... He's usually, he's using the axe from inside the home. Okay. John Dan Antonio, who is a retired Italian detective, made a public statement in which he hypothesized that the man who had committed the X-Man murders was the same man who had killed several individuals in 1911. John said that there were all these similarities, like the manner by which the two sets of homicides had been committed, and he described the potential killer as an individual of dual personalities who killed without motive, which we have talked about. Right. And he said this kind of person could very likely be a normal, law-abiding citizen who was often overcome by an overwhelming desire to kill. Wow. And he later goes on to describe the killer as a real-life Dr. Jekyll and and Mr. Mr. Hyde. Hyde. Yeah. Wow. Then in nearby Gretna, Louisiana, lived Charles Cordomiglia and his wife, Rosie, along with their infant daughter, who was named Mary. Hmm. He's an Italian immigrant who lives on the corner of Jefferson Avenue and 2nd Street. This is a New Orleans suburb, which is across the Mississippi River. Would that be in the French Quarter? No, it's across the Mississippi River. Oh, across the Mississippi. Okay. Yeah. Okay. March 10th, 1919, screams are heard coming from the Cordomiglia residence. Grocer I. Orlando Giordano rushes across the street to see what's going on. When he gets to the house, he notices that Charles, his wife, and their daughter had all been attacked by an unknown intruder. Rosie was standing in the driveway with a serious head wound, and she's clutching her deceased little girl, Uh. Mary. Charles is laying in the floor. He's bleeding profusely. The couple was rushed to Charity Hospital, where it was discovered that both had suffered skull fractures. And again, nothing was stolen from the house, but a panel on the back door had been chiseled away, and a bloody axe was found on the back porch of the home. Wow. Now, Charles survives and is released from the hospital two days later, while his wife, Rosie, stayed in the care of the doctors at the hospital. And when she regains full consciousness, Rosie says that I, Orlando Giordano, and his eight 18-year-old son, Frank, were responsible for the attacks. Oh. This is the guy who found him, right? Right. Giordano is a 69-year-old man who was in too poor of health to have committed the crimes. That's what the police think. Okay. And Frank, who's more than six feet tall, weighs over 200 pounds, and they couldn't have fit him through that spot in the door with a shoehorn. There's no yeah. way. <laughs> they couldn't have shoved him through. No amount of butter is going to get that No amount of Crisco there. is making it. <laughs> so Charles denies his wife's claim. But the police arrest the two of them and charge them with murder anyway. They, really? they want somebody to pay for this yeah. stuff. And like the Corte Miglias, the Giordanos were in the grocery business in Gretna. Hmm. And the Corte Miglia and Giordano families had been close, but they recently quarreled. Okay. When the Corte Miglias opened a competing grocery store down the street from the Giordano store. And police theorized that this falling out between these two rival businesses had spurred this attack. Gotcha. And according to the Giordanos, however, the quarrel had largely blown over by the time of the attack. And the Giordano family had remained especially fond of little Mary, who referred to the father, who's 69, as grandpa. Oh, 
Now, despite the severity of their injuries, Rosie and Charlie both survived. Rosie suffered a fractured skull and brain injury, and her treating physician, Dr. Landry, believed the attack might leave her with a, quote, permanently faulty mind, end quote. <laughs> that was, that was Is the, that because she's a woman, Dr. Landry? <laughs> that was the technical description yeah, back in 1918. Yeah, it's in quotes. It's actually in quotes. <laughs> a faulty mind. A permanently faulty mind. <laughs> and during the time that the Cordomiglias were being treated at Charity Hospital, the Gretna police and Sheriff Louis H. Marrero hounded them for details of the attack. And initially, both Charlie and Rosie told doctors, police and family members, they had no idea who attacked them. Hmm. And regardless, police arrested I. Orlando and Frank Giordano a week after the attack and held them in the Gretna jail. Oh, wow. Yeah, they just they showed up and then they kind of had a beef with them. And so they're like, oh, we got motive. It's these two guys. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. On March 28, 1919, Rosie was released from the hospital. Sheriff Marrero immediately arrested her as a material witness and placed her in the Gretna jail. The next morning, Rosie, who could not read or write English, was released upon signing an affidavit identifying the Giordanos as the attackers. Hmm. And a coroner's jury was convened on April 13th to assist with the coroner's inquest by collecting preliminary information about Mary's death. And after hearing Rosie's testimony, identifying the Giordanos, the coroner's jewelry returned a verdict of murder wow. against Frank and Irelando. Wow. Now, by this time, the Giordanos had retained William H. Burns Jr., an experienced defense attorney. And following the coroner's jury verdict, Burns immediately contested the jailing of Rosie, and he requested she receive a mental competency exam. And Judge John E. Flurry granted Burns' request and scheduled a preliminary hearing for May 7th. Okay. Then on May 5th, 1919, Irelando and Frank are indicted for Mary Cordomiglia's murder. And with this indictment, Judge Flurry canceled the preliminary hearing, ruling that it would be, quote, useless and unnecessary, end quote, and set a trial date of May 19th, 1919. Okay. Now, on May 19th, the Giordano's joint trial begins in the 28th District Court, which served as the District Court for St. Charles, St. John, and Jefferson Parishes, and District Attorney Robert Rivardi, who had close political and personal ties to the sheriff, prosecuted the case. Now, the state's case depended on Rosie's ID. Like, it was her identification. She testified that I. Orlando and Frank had been in her bedroom at the time of the attack and that Frank attacked Mary with the axe. Okay. And Charlie testified that he had no recollection of the attack. So the wife says one thing, the husband says another. Right. Frank and I. Orlando each testified, and the prosecution asked about threats the two had allegedly made against each other. Both men denied having made any such statements, and the people who had supposedly heard these threats were never called to testify. And then in cross-examination, the prosecution tried to present Frank as untruthful, and they emphasized these minor inaccuracies in his statements to the police, you know, that he hadn't been home as early. They're trying to railroad these two sure, people. Absolutely. I can read all of this to you, but they're really just trying. They're trying to railroad these people. Yeah, you don't even have to read in between the lines. On yeah, this one. and they're just trying to show that this evidence of this actual murder, it related to the axe man or his crimes. And it was the attack on the Cordomiglias that fit the pattern of a serial killer who was known to be active. Right. So the jury found Frank and I. Orlando guilty on May 26, 1919. Frank was convicted of murder in the first degree and sentenced to death. Wow. And I. Orlando was convicted of murder, quote, without capital punishment. His sentence was life in prison. Mm. And after their sentences were read, Frank rose and addressed the courtroom and said, quote, Judge, you can hang me if you want to. I'd rather hang than die with a lie on my conscience like I know one witness in this case will do. But don't send my father to the penitentiary for life. He's innocent as I am. Hang me and set him free. Wow. And a reporter for the Times Picayune, Jim Colton, was convinced that the Giordanos were innocent. And he promised Frank he would work to uncover the truth. And Judge Fleury denied the Giordano's motion for a new trial, and Burns filed an appeal to the Louisiana State Court in November of 1919. Okay. 
But in January of 1920, the Giordanos made the news again when I, Orlando's daughter, Anna, held her wedding reception at the Gretna Jail so that her father and brother could be a part of the celebration. Aww. That's yeah. very sweet. And then on February 3rd, 1920, Rosie spoke with Colton and recanted her testimony. What? Rosie goes back on what she says. Rosie said her accusations against the Giordanos were false. Oh, my. And she explained that, quote, St. Joseph had come to her in a dream <laughs> and told her not to die with this sin on her conscience. Rosie signed a statement stating that the attackers' faces had been covered with red bandanas and she didn't recognize them or their voices. News of her retraction made headlines yes, all across yeah. the country. And soon after making the statement, Rosie was admitted to the hospital with smallpox. Oh. Yeah. Wow. And District Attorney Rivardi remained convinced that the Giordanos were guilty and he didn't believe Rosie's recantation. And he threatened to charge her with perjury if she changed her original trial testimony. <laughs> Uh, they were done with everything. They wanted to move on. Yeah. I don't care if the truth comes out or not. Let's let's get this over with. Yeah. Then on March 6, 1920, the Giordano's appeal was heard by the Louisiana Supreme Court, and they said the prosecution had failed to turn over the defense's Rosie's written statement identifying Giordano's or to produce the witness who had allegedly heard the Giordano's making threats. Hmm. And on April 5th, the court granted the appeal and overturned the Giordano's convictions. Okay. Rosie recovered from smallpox, and she was released from the hospital on April 23rd, and she repeatedly and recanted under oath in front of a notary and several witnesses in a Times-Picayune article where she accused Gretna jailer Charles Bergbacher of threatening her with life in prison if she did not identify the Giordanos. So wow. now she's saying she was getting coerced to do this. So, okay, First of all, let's go back for a second. Why did she ever give a reason why she recanted her statement? Yes, Saint Joseph himself came down. <laughs> okay. Remember? No, I remember it was a that. A sign from God. <laughs> I mean, okay, it was a sign. That from was her only God. reason for recanting. That's what she says. And then, then, she, then she says that she was coerced, which she might have been because they were really trying to find somebody. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Gee whiz. Yes. But eventually the father and son are both released from jail. Okay, good. Now, I, I moved ahead a little bit because I wanted to get through that whole trial and get those two out of jail. Okay. But before all of that happens, in the middle of this. But wait, there's more. <laughs> <laughs> the axe man is still out there. Yeah. So after little Mary Cordomiglia is murdered and her parents maimed, the police put out a statement saying that all of the crimes were committed by the same man, a, quote, bloodthirsty maniac filled with a passion for human slaughter, right. end quote. Right. This is where it gets weird. <laughs> like we haven't been there yet. <laughs> I know. But then on March 14th, 1919, a letter is received at the Times-Picayune. It's dated from hell. On March 13th, 1919. And I'm going to read you the whole thing. Right. You might want to put some music behind this. <laughs> this is the kind of thing. I'm going to read long form. Here we go. And I've got the perfect piece of music for you. Esteemed mortal, they have never caught me and they never will. They have never seen me, for I am invisible, even as the ether that surrounds your earth. I am not a human being but a spirit and a demon from the hottest hell. I am what you Orleanians and you foolish police call the Axeman. When I see fit, I shall come and claim other victims. I alone know who they shall be. I shall leave no clue except my bloody axe, be smeared with blood and brains of he whom I have sent below to keep me company. If you wish, you may tell the police to be careful to not to rile me, of course, I am a reasonable spirit. I take no offense at the way they have conducted their investigations in the past. In fact, they have been so utterly stupid as to not only amuse me, but his satanic majesty, Francis, Yosef, etc. But tell them to beware. Tell them not to try to discover what I am, for it was better that they were never born than to incur the wrath of the Axeman. I don't think there is any need of such a warning, for I feel sure the police will always dodge me, as they have in the past. They are wise and know how to keep away from all harm. 
Undoubtedly, you Orleanians think of me as a most horrible murderer, which I am, but I could be much worse if I wanted to. If I wished, I could pay a visit to your city every night. At will, I could slay thousands of your best citizens, for I am in close relationship with the angel of death. Now, to be exact, at 12.15 earthly time, on next Tuesday night, March 19, 1919, I'm going to pass over New Orleans. In my infinite mercy, I'm going to make a little proposition to you, people. Here it is. I am very fond of jazz music, and I swear by all the devils in the nether regions that every person shall be spared in whose home a jazz band is in full swing at the time I have just mentioned. If everyone has a jazz band going, well, then so much the better for you people. One thing is certain is that some of your people who do not jazz it on Tuesday night, if there be any, will get the axe. Well, as I am cold and crave the warmth of my native Tartarus, and it's about time I leave your earthly home, I will cease my discourse, hoping that thou wilt publish this, that it will go well with thee. I have been, am, and will be the worst spirit that ever existed, either in fact or realm of fancy. Signed, The Axeman. Wow. I knew it had to be a gigging musician. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, that's just out there that's crazy but per the killer's statement that no one listening to jazz on march 19th would get the axe (laughs) the music flowed from homes across much of the city dance halls were filled to capacity and professional and amateur bands played jazz at parties at hundreds of houses around town and no one was killed It's kind of like those Facebook memes that says, you know, if you pass this uh, meme along, you'll you'll have yeah, it's like a chain letter. It's like a chain letter. (laughs) That's exactly what this guy's doing. Yeah, he's just ahead of his time. Yeah, and if you liked that music, it's one of Rob's pieces from the film score of Dog Days of Summer, and you can find that and others on iTunes and Spotify and Pandora. I actually have a Rob Podorf station (laughs) on Pandora. I have the real Rob Podorf, but I also have one. I also have the Rob Podorf station. Yeah, and uh, all of my scores are on every streaming service available. Yeah, but I do love that. It's called the Flea Circus. Yeah. From Dog Days of Summer. And that's called foreshadowing. <laughs> <laughs> but there was even music written, and it's called The Axeman's Jazz by Joseph John Davila. Yeah, and you actually had me play and record this, so uh, here's a little snippet of how this ditty goes. So people were listening to this kind of jazz, so their home would be passed over. It's like Exodus in the Bible, which is kind of ironic because he says he's from hell. Yeah. But the story in the Bible is God tells Moses and Aaron to instruct the Israelites to paint blood from their Passover lambs on the frames of their doors. Right. And painting blood on the door frame signified their faith in God, and it warned and marked them from the pagan Egyptians. Right. And when the angel of death passed through Egypt, he would pass over the doors marked with the blood, hence the name Passover. Right. So is it Passover, but with jazz? (laughs) Oh, man. Because he says you better jazz it. Yeah. (laughs) Wow, that's crazy. Yeah, jazz it. Better jazz it. Yeah. So New Orleans people go absolutely nuts. Everyone's in a panic because they think the Axeman has this supernatural power to slip into homes unnoticed and paint the walls red with the blood of his victims. Mm -hmm. And on the night of March 19th, 1919, every single New Orleans dance hall was chock-a-block full. That's just amazing. And jazz is blaring out of every window in the city. And I already said there were no murders that night. Mm. And the police think that maybe, just maybe, the Axeman's finished. Okay. Not so fast. Yeah, I was going to say, and he's not going to stop. Not so fast. Then on August 10th, 1919, grocer Steve Boca is attacked in his bedroom as he slept by an axe-wielding intruder. He wakes up during the night to find a dark figure looming over his bed. And when he regains consciousness, he, like, gets up, leaves his house, runs across the street, and finds out that his head's been cracked open. Wow. And the grocer ran to the home of his neighbor, Frank Januzzi, where he lost consciousness and collapsed. Okay. Nothing had been taken from his home yet once again, and a panel on the back door of the home had been chiseled away, and Steve recovered from his injuries, but he couldn't 
remember anything yeah. from the attack. Right. A month later, Sarah Lawman is attacked on the night of September 3rd, 1919. Her neighbors come to check on her because Sarah lived alone, and when she doesn't answer the door, they break into her house, and what they find is Sarah lying unconscious on her bed with a severe head injury, and she's missing several of her teeth. Mm. The intruder entered through an open window and then hit Sarah in the face with an axe that was discovered on the front lawn of the building. She will recover from her injuries, but... Sarah won't be able to remember anything about the attack. Wow. Then on October 27th, 1919, grocer Mike Pepitone's wife, Esther, hears a noise in her husband's bedroom. I guess these two sleep in different bedrooms. She goes to the door of his room and she sees a large, axe-wielding man fleeing the scene. Her husband, Mike, had been hit in the head and he's covered in blood. Blood spatter is all over the majority of the room, including a painting of the Virgin Mary. That was what was in the newspaper. Wow. Mike and his wife had six children. But here's the thing about the Axeman. What's the point? Why? Why would he enter the home by chiseling these small holes into the doors and walls? I mean, there would never be any other sign of him getting into the house. He wasn't breaking down doors. And after hitting his victims with the axe, he would never rob them. Money and valuables were always left untouched. You know, whatever he found in the home, he was just there to murder them. Right. The straight razor, the axe, which was pretty common among the homes, which are heated with burning wood stoves, which we talked about, and a lamp. And when he used their axe or their straight razor, he always left them behind in the yard, in the bedroom, in the bathroom. Right. So in 1919, were they, t- I, I don't know this, were they taking fingerprints in 1919? Um, you know what? I do know the answer to this. Okay. They did take fingerprints at this time, and they did take fingerprints of all the people that they thought were suspects, uh-huh. but the system wasn't sophisticated right. enough. So it didn't... And they didn't have like a ton of fingerprints on file to know who they would belong to. So the fr- fingerprints that they took off of the axe and the razor and all that stuff just didn't match any of the other people. Right. Well, I think it was just in its its primitive state. Gotcha. Uh, yeah. But okay. but yes, I it did say, I did read in one of my sources that, that um, fingerprints were a thing then. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Inquiring minds want to know. Yeah. Okay. Now, we already know that police tried to pin these murders on several innocent people. And although no one has ever officially been given credit for the murders, There's some theories, and here's one of them. Okay. After the murder of her husband, Mike Pepitone, Esther moves to Los Angeles where she remarries Angelo Albano. And on the second anniversary of her late husband, Mike's murder, husband number two, Angelo, mysteriously disappears. Hmm. Now, Angelo used to have business relations with a man who went by the name Joseph Mumphrey. And Mumphrey visited Esther's home on December 5th, 1921, where he demanded $500 and jewelry. If Esther refused, Mumphrey would, quote, kill her the same way he had killed her husband, end quote. Oh. And Esther, however, got a revolver and shot him dead. So this is. (laughs) Go Esther. So what Esther is saying is this is the axe murderer. He just came in and confessed. I'm the one who killed your husband, Mike. I'll do to you what I did to Mike. So when police came, Esther claimed that she saw that same man on the night her husband, Mike, was murdered. And police found circumstantial evidence linking Mumphrey to Pepitone's murder, including Mumphrey's leadership role in a blackmailing gang Uh in New Orleans targeting Italians. Really? Yes. Oh, wow. And adding to the likelihood of Mumphrey being the Axeman is the earlier 1912 shooting of the Skyambras. The prime suspect in that case had the name Momfrey, hmm. and Joseph Mumphrey was known to go by multiple names. Gotcha. So one with an O, one with a U. Gotcha. And despite this, experts still disagree on Mumphrey's guilt, since no substantial evidence linking Mumphrey to the axe killings has ever been found. The murder of Mike Pepitone and the other family could be attributed to the Italian gang violence, and whether Pepitone was killed with an axe is still disputed. Many theories abound about who the axe man was or what actually happened to him later, and evidence from police records and newspapers show that he may have reappeared in Louisiana sometime later. Alexandria, DeRitter, and Lake Charles all had Italian grocers fall victim to axe attacks. Oh, well, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. However, after that, the axe man completely vanishes. Hmm. Now, there are loads of people who believe that the spirits of the Axeman's victims still haunt New Orleans. Which you and I 
have gone on the ghost tour in New Orleans. We have, and New Orleans is known to be a pretty yeah. paranormally active area, yeah. right? Yep. Well, the house where Joseph Maggio and his wife Catherine lived is said to be haunted by both of them. Oh, wow. And on certain nights near the area, people have reported hearing screams and shrieks. Wow. The hospital where Joseph Romano was treated is said to be haunted with his restless spirit. Really? Yes. <laughs> Charity Hospital. Wow. And according to local legend, the haunted hotel of NOLA is the location believed to be where the axe man hid out in between picking his victims. Really? This is the place where he slept between his murder sprees. Wow. And the natives believe that his ghoulish specter remains at the hotel. <laughs> In the back of the hotel, there's a quaint courtyard with a strange, dark vibe. Visitors have claimed to have seen wandering shadows, pools of blood. They've captured strange EVPs and even experienced bizarre electrical hiccups with their cell phones. Really? Yeah. Very paranormally charged. Wow. wow. Yeah. And to this day, from March 13th to March 15th, it is a New Orleans tradition to play jazz in most pubs, clubs, and discos at least one night. Oh, really? <laughs> in order to ward the Axeman's fury. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Now, today, the Axeman has provided plenty of writers with ideas, like myself, mm -hmm. including American Horror Story, the story The Coven, with the episode The Axeman Cometh. And I thought that this was interesting. In the virtual reality game, The Walking Dead, Saints and Sinners, multiple references to the Axeman can be found. A character references him in dialogue, and a special axe can be found in a safe with the phrase, quote, the Axeman cometh on the side. <laughs> wow. There's a reference to him liking jazz, as well as his famous quote from the infamous Axeman's letter, which is used to describe the special axe that can be found known as the esteemed mortal, because that's how he starts it, dear esteemed mortal. Right. But the secret identity of the jazz-loving, Italy-hating Axeman of New Orleans will likely stay a mystery forever. But that is the story of the Axeman of New Orleans, and that's all I have to say about that. Hey, Hitch to Homicide listeners, it's the season of Halloween, and if you're not just a fan of true crime, but also scary tales based on real life, then I have got a read for you. Beauty is a dark thriller and love story based on actual events. From 1911 to 1933, 166 patients, mostly mentally challenged girls, left the Rosewood Asylum for the feeble-minded outside of Baltimore, Maryland, under writs of habeas corpus, to unknowingly become slaves for the blue bloods of Baltimore's society. When it was finally discovered, only 102 girls could be accounted for. The other 64 were never located or heard from again. This is the tale of one of those girls, as her true story unfolds 100 years later for novelist and part-time home renovator Eliza Lovelace. Between the world that Eliza can see and the one she can only feel lies the truth of beauty, where one girl's dream is another girl's nightmare. Don't miss Reading Beauty during the spooky season, available online at all major booksellers. And you can always find all of my books at chriscalvert.com. Remember, don't read it alone or in the dark. And thanks for being a Hitch to Homicide listener. Okay, well, the axe man cometh. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. That's crazy. Keep, keep your axes hidden. Right. It's still October. And my apologies to all my gigging musicians. <laughs> That's right. right. Okay, so let's let's get to a little. Well, bless your heart. I'm I'm going to do a bless your heart speed round. <gasps> I like these. I know. All right, let's do it. Well, bless your heart. All right. First up, robber uses cucumber as a gun and hopes no one notices. 
<laughs> is that a cucumber in your pants or are you just happy to see me? I'm um, sure I'm sorry, that's in really poor taste. Sorry. A man tried to rob a Glasgow bookmakers while armed with only a cucumber a few years ago. <laughs> However, he was soon tackled to the ground by an off duty officer when it was clear that the harmless vegetable wasn't going to be much of a threat. Did the police officer have like a something bigger, a carrot? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Gary Ruff revealed his weapon of choice covered in a black sock at a female worker at Ladsbroke in Shettleston, <laughs> demanding cash. After she refused... There's a cucumber in a black sock. <laughs> That's what he had. Okay. After you buried she, the lead. <laughs> yeah. After she refused, Ruff was pinned down by the officer and quickly arrested. He told police it was all a joke before asking, am I getting the jail for this? The jail? Am I getting the jail? Yeah, that's what he said. Am I getting the jail for this? He was jailed at the high court in Glasgow in 2014 after admitting assault with intent to rob with a cucumber. Assault with a deadly vegetable. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yeah, it was good. Okay, number two, burglar falls asleep on job. A retired couple from Lancashire returned home from their holiday in 2014 only to find a burglar fast asleep in their bed. Now, we've done a couple of these before. Mm -hmm, this mm -hmm. one's different. You're across the pond today. <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly. Is, yeah. Martin Holdby and Pat Dyson were shocked to find, and this is hard to say, he's got a strange name, Luke's as Choing Lascara. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's it's there's a lot more consonants than is there. this thing yeah. on? <laughs> Bless you. <laughs> yeah, it's L U K A S Z. Yeah, don't even go Choinzowski. I think that's close. All right, uh, to find Luke Skaz Choinzowski. Oh my God, you did it again. <laughs> I know, having a quiet nap. Now here's where it gets fun. Oh, we're not to the fun part no, yet? No, no, no. Okay. Not only that. Okay. But he had done their dishes, washed his underwear, and bought some groceries. Oh, yeah. what did he buy? Well, Pat said their house wasn't too tidy when they left for their trip, but the Polish-born Chownzowski had taken time to tidy up. He did burn an old saucepan, but that happens, she added. The man admitted burglary and was given a two-year conditional discharge <laughs> in order to pay 200 pounds in cost. And he owes her a skillet. Yeah, he yeah, has a skillet. I want my skillet. Back. Number three, criminal uses stolen phone to take selfie in the house he's burglaring. Okay. Right. Yep. One of the many foolish thieves to be found out by a selfie, Ashley Keist, actually used a stolen SIM card to take a photo inside the house he was robbing. The Rotherham resident then posted the picture on WhatsApp, not realizing Oops. not realizing he had sent the picture to the victim's work colleagues. Oh. <laughs> Officer soon found him at his home, also with a stolen Rolex hidden behind a radiator. He was jailed for two years and eight months in 2014. These are all in 2014. Yeah, and okay. here's my very favorite. Oh, good Lord. We got one more. One more. Man uses wanted poster as his Facebook profile pic. Well, I've heard of this one before. <laughs> Police didn't struggle finding Mac Yearwood in Florida. Once again, we're back in Florida. Who was wanted in connection with an assault in 2016 after proudly uploading his wanted poster as his Facebook profile I mean, picture. you know, if you get a good shot at a good <laughs> yeah. angle, why yeah. not use it? I yeah. mean, it was his best side. Yeah. One of his friends commented, nice mug shot, to which he replied, thanks, buddy. <laughs> Cops used his Facebook to track him down, and he was soon arrested. The Stewart Police Department later wrote on Facebook, Facebook is a great way to communicate and connect with old friends and family. And catch criminals. If, you want, if you're wanted by the police, it's probably not a good idea to use the wanted of the week poster of yourself as did the he, pros pile pick. Did he have on uh, the orange or the stripes or? No, it was his mug when they brought him oh, in. Oh, it's just his mug. Okay, okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, some of the mug shots they actually have on the orange yeah. jumpsuit, I yeah. guess. No. No, he looks very happy and content. Oops. Yeah. Well, you know, if you get a good angle, I never get a good angle. Yeah. Every shot, I look like Jabba the Hutt in every single <laughs> picture, it. no matter what. No, she well, doesn't. if you have a good, bless your heart, yep. go to the website, hitchtohomicide.com. There's a pull down menu. You can go in there and suggest a case. And yep. You can also 
bless somebody's heart. Mm-hmm. Give us a story about somebody's heart who needs to be blessed. <laughs> These people definitely I'm bless- need to be I'm blessed. I'm blessing people all over the place, <laughs> just like the woman who got the word from St. Joseph himself. <laughs> Lord have mercy. That's all I got to say today. All right. That's my husband out there in the studio. And that's my beautiful bride in there. <laughs> Join us next time on Hitch to Homicide. Bye, y'all. Bye, y'all.